on our campus today who are doing more to bridge the world of intellect and the world of politics than tonight's speaker, Professor Léonce de Cumana. Before I say a few more words about our distinguished speaker, let me just give you an idea of the procedure. So I'll continue with my introduction, and then uh, Professor Di Comana will speak uh, for approximately 45 minutes, uh, possibly less. Um, at the end of the lecture, I'll come back and thank our guest and give him a token of our appreciation. And at that point, you'll be free to go. Um, so we expect to be done um, at eight, uh, not later than 8.30. Um, those of you, however, who wish to stay and ask questions will be invited to come to the front uh, and to meet Professor Dikumana. Professor Dikumana was born in Burundi. In the late 1980s, he co-authored an open letter to the president pleading to stop civilian killings taking place in the north of the country. He was punished with five months of solitary confinement. Amnesty International classified him as a prisoner of conscience. He came to the United States and pursued graduate studies in economics at the University of Washington in St. Louis, and his academic career skyrocketed from there. Professor Dikumana is an expert on African economies, on the global flow of money from one continent to another, and how this impacts the power of regimes in international relations. He has numerous publications, including a book co-authored with James Boyce called Africa's Odious Debt, how Foreign Loans and Capital Flight Bled a Continent, published in 2011. He's received numerous academic honors and is the Andrew Glynn Professor of Economics at UMass Amherst. As a political consultant in the United Nations, Professor Dikumana has held a series of high-level positions. He is truly someone whose ideas have changed the world. More specifically, he's shaped how key economic issues are framed and debated in important global forums such as G20 summits. Recently, a French blog announced that Professor Di Comana uh, acquired a new, new position. He was appointed by the Secretary of the UN to be a member of the Committee for Development and Policy. Another French citizen then wrote in the following comment. Not only should Léonce Di Comana be proud of his nomination, but the state of Burundi should long ago have conferred on this illustrious researcher and professor a medal of honor for the services he has rendered to the African continent and to the world. Please join me in welcoming Léonce de Kumana, who will discuss what would Plato say about Africa's odious debts. Uh, very nice introduction. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here and a pleasure for me to be talking to you all about uh, my work. Um, it was one of my best uh, things to happen last year was to come back to UMass. I had been away for uh, five years and a half uh, working at the UN uh, in Ethiopia, which I enjoyed a lot, and uh, working for the African Development Bank in Tunisia, and I witnessed the revolution. Now I can see, I can say it was great, but it was scary at that time. Uh, but I learned a lot uh, working with uh, policy makers, government, and also having a chance to travel uh, in Africa a lot. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about a subject that I have been working on with my colleague Jim Boyce, uh, which is capital flight in general and how it relates to development financing, external borrowing. And today, because I'm talking to philosophers, students of philosophy, I was asked to become a philosopher, which I'm not. Don't be fooled, I'm not a philosopher. I know nothing about philosophy. Uh, but I hope that some of the issues that we discuss in, with regards to capital flight are actually related to uh, philosophers' views about the role of the state, the role of leadership, and responsibilities of, of the state, 
vis-a-vis -vis of people and issues of justice. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to, how I'm going to try to frame uh, the discussion. So most of the um, evidence I'm going to present here is uh, from the book that uh, you heard about, which is on uh, capital flight, uh, that Jim and I uh, published last year. Um, just show you the cover page. It's called Africa's Odious Death, How uh, Foreign Loans and uh, Capital Flight Play a Continent, which you can get from uh, Amazon uh, and any other sources. So, but today we talk about what Plato would, have, would say if he was here today, or if we had asked him then, what would he say about Odious Death? And then I'll tell you what you mean by Odious Death. But uh, the focus will be on the, on the state, the rulers, and justice, as uh, presented or discussed in uh, Plato's uh, uh, writings. Disclaimer, I know nothing about this man. <laughs> so don't be surprised if I make uh, outrageous uh, statements that are not back to what, what but this is this is a this is normal. Uh, big writers, big intellectuals, after they have gone, everybody says things about what they said, what they did, even though they didn't say. It. But I hope I won't be too far from what he has he has uh, uh, he had in mind. So let's start first of all with what uh, the ordinary reader, the ordinary citizens have heard years about. Africa, or in newspapers, magazines, books. What you hear about Africa mostly is that it's a severely indebted continent. That African countries have borrowed a lot, very indebted um, to the rest of the world. That it is a continent that is uh, dependent on aid, and you'll hear from some corners that in fact aid is draining the resources of developed countries. They're paying a lot of money. You, uh, sometimes I'm amazed at how people, how much people think that the U.S. is sending to Africa. The U.S. has a lot of money. If we stop sending money to, to, to Africa, we'll be rich. I'll show you that that is not true. Um, the other uh, uh, conception of uh, how Africa is portrayed is that it's a, it's, a, it's a continent that's prone to corruption and dictatorship to the point where uh, some of the explanation for capital flight is actually uh, alluding to dictatorship and Africa. And what also you, you feel sometimes is that people almost blame it on the African people that they are responsible for the bad leaders they get, they should vote them out of, of, of office. Because you have to understand that for, for people who grew up in democratic systems, where actually we vote out leaders we don't want, they would want Africans also to be able to do that. But the context is very different. Many times we see leaders who are in power for long, 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 even too long, and the people have can't really uh, get rid of them. If you don't it. But the reality of Africa is, uh, about Africa is quite different. Um, I had just told you that the first perception was Africa was heavily indebted. But when we look at the facts, we look at how much Africa has been borrowing from the rest of the world. These are loans that Africa needs to pay. So every year, countries borrow money, but they pay back the past loans. So the graph you see here, I'm, I'm sorry, economists cannot speak without graphs. <laughs> so bad. Um, this graph shows you every year how much money the difference between how much money African countries borrowed and the amount of money they paid back to their lenders. <coughs> so a positive number means that they kept a positive, a positive balance on the, on, on the, or, uh, that benefited the African countries. A negative balance means that on a net basis, African countries paid to the rest of the world more than they received. And in fact, you see that in some years, in the, uh, uh, in the 90s, 
all the way up to oh, about 2005, there was a net tra negative transfer to African countries. So African countries were paying to the rest of the world. Um, the, the other piece of evidence we show is that if you look at the money that leaves Africa as capital flight, and capital flight is simply defined here as unrecorded transfers of money from Africa. This is different from investment officially recorded by the government, which is called foreign direct investment. So if you had an African who buys a company, invests in a company abroad, it's registered with the central bank and the ministry of, of I mean, the, the customs authority. That's not what we mean by, that's not part of capital flight. Capital flight is when people uh, literally takes, for example, suitcases of cash from government budgets and go deposit it in bank accounts. I'm not making up the story. If you read the news since last, the last two years in, in the French news, you will see you will hear uh, uh, evidence of presidents, sons of presidents, wives of presidents, who were caught with suitcases of money, going to deposit them uh, the cash in bank accounts in Paris, Belgium, and so on. In Burundi, one of the uh, key official uh, government uh, leaders in, in, uh, was caught uh, a few months ago uh, with uh, briefcase of money of $300,000 to be deposited in a Belgian bank account. And this is the same guy was in was actually the ombudsman of the government. Yeah, the ombudsman of the government. And one of his role was to fight corruption. And he had void, void, uh, vowed to uh, uh, bring to justice every member of the government who, who, was, uh, who was found to be corrupt. And this is the same man who goes to Belgium with $300,000 to deposit in a bank account. So this is one of the ways in, in which uh, money leaks out of uh, uh, African countries. So when we do the numbers, we look at 33 sub-Saharan African countries from 1970 to 2008. We, uh, we count the amount of money that, made, that, went, that, uh, that went missing. What we mean by when money went missing is that countries receive foreign exchange inflows by borrowing or through private investments by foreigners, what we call foreign direct investment. These resources that are coming from abroad are what allows African countries to pay for the current account deficit, which means they want to have to pay for imports. And the difference is accumulated as reserves for them to use in rainy days. Normally, if every movement is accounted for, the balance should be zero. The income, uh, uh, incoming inflows, the use to pay for the country's dues vis-a-vis the rest of the world, and the accumulated reserve would balance out. But in reality, we find that there is missing money that cannot be traced. And uh, even the, the IMF many times have found, <coughs> especially in oil-rich countries, uh, in Angola there was a case where the, 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 the IMF found, uh, could not track down $5 billion of export of oil. That means that money, uh, oil was sold, but the money could not be tracked in the books of the, of, the, of the government. That's part of the money that goes into private accounts in the Cayman Islands, in Paris, New York uh, in uh, secret bank accounts. So what we see, what we find is that if we take then the total amount of money that has leaked out of, of, of the continent and accounted for from 1970 to 2008, it's about, and we assume that this money would have accumulated interest. They have invested the money in, in, uh, in uh, interest earning assets. It's a, it, it's a, the total of it is 900, 44 billion. So we can say that these countries have 944 billion stashed out there in bank accounts 
uh, real estate, mansions, and all that. But these countries, at the same time, owe to the rest of the world about 177 billion. Now, in the beginning, I told you that people think that Africa is heavily indebted. Yes, it's heavily indebted, 177 billion. But if you gave Africa a small fraction of the money that leaked out of the continent, they would wipe out all their debts. So Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the world. More money outside that they would they, they, they go to the rest of the world. The other uh, perception was that Africa is heavily dependent on aid. So what we do again is look at these 33 countries for which we have good data and look at how much they have received in foreign aid from 1970 to 2008. To make the data comparable, we, we convert that into, in terms of $2,008. Okay? We do the same for capital flight, this time not including interest earnings. So that's why the, the amount is a little smaller, because did, we did add interest. But still, it's much higher than the aid received by African countries. The message here is that, yes, Africa receives aid, but Africa would not need aid if they could keep the money that they, uh, that's, that's leaking from out of the continent. So if Africa could keep its resources onshore, they would not depend on it. Okay. What we also find in our analysis is that there is a very systematic relationship between capital flight, the money that's leaking out of the continent through suitcases, direct transfers from, back from government accounts to private accounts and so on, is closely related to external growth. In the sense that we find actually that some of the money lent to African countries ends up being in private accounts in the form of capital money. Sits out of the continent. In some cases, the money never even leaves the bank that lent the money to, 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 to the African government. So the idea is you, you have a government official, corrupt Af African government official, coming in through that door. Behind that, there is a bank that's going to sign a loan to the African government, 100 million. The government official takes home 80 million, 20 million remains on his account. It's like, it's like the money came out that went back in the, in, the, in the bank, but this time in the form of private money. <coughs> so we find that um, external borrowing fuels capital flight in the sense that the money borrowed by the government is actually contributing to making the government officials wealthy as opposed to developing the, the, the country. Um, our estimates show that of every dollar that goes into Africa every year, about half goes back out as capital flight. So Africa keeps half or less of the borrowed funds. The rest goes to accumulating private, private wealth. So, and this is facilitated by what we call uh, safe havens. I'm sure you have heard this before. These are financial centers. You have heard about the Cayman Islands and all of the Bahamas, where you can open a bank account almost with no documentation. Uh, companies can register in those in those in those registers almost with no documentation. You find uh, uh, companies that have only a PO box in those in those in those places, and there is no activities being 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 operated there. So why do they do that? Why? Why would a company, a U.S. company, a British company, open a branch in the Cayman Islands and register there? They don't have to pay taxes on the operations that they do there. They don't have to, to report to the government any of their accounts, so they can hide all their money there. But also, it allows them to do a clever accounting that we call transfer pricing, which means if a country, if a company is, a, say, a UK company or an American company, but it has branches in the Cayman Islands, in the Cayman Islands, they don't pay taxes. So the accountants of the company will make sure that the profits of the company are mostly recorded in the Cayman Islands. Whereas in the US, they report very little profit by inflating the costs and under-declaring the profit, the, the benefits. 
That's what goes on even for companies that operate in Africa. Mineral companies, oil companies, you'll find that they make no profit in Africa. There's a, a very good uh, colleague of mine, uh, his, uh, his name is, uh, is uh, Raymond Becker. He runs the Global Financial Integrity in Washington, D.C., uh, doing a very good work on elite financial flows. One day he told me that uh, he worked in, in Nigeria for a long, long time, starting from the 60s, and he had a private company there. So when he went there, he said he was anxious to know how you do, you, do, you do business in Nigeria. So he asked one of the businessmen who was a British operator, and he says, how do you operate here? How do you make a profit in this, in this place? He says, you don't understand. I'm not here to make a profit. He said, you hear me? Not to make a profit? But later on he understood that the company's accounting system was not to declare, was not meant to declare profits in Nigeria because then they would have paid taxes on them. They would operate in Nigeria, produce in Nigeria, but they make profit in the Cayman Islands, or Switzerland, or, or um, whatever, whatever jurisdiction that, that taxes, that has a lower tax, tax rate. Which means that Nigeria is benefiting, is not benefiting from the operations of this company. Uh, two years ago, the uh, watchdog organization Global Witness made an investigation about SAP Miller, which is a brewery company, a British brewery company, operates in many, many countries. But that, their, their investigation was focused on Ghana. They have branches in Ghana. They produce uh, beer, which is sold all over the world, but also in Ghana. What they found was that that company, big as it is, was paying no tax in Ghana because they were running zero, I mean, negative profit. They found that a, a Ghanaian lady who was running a, sh a small shop where she was selling SAD Miller beers was paying more taxes than SAD Miller. That's how it works. So the company pays no taxes in, in Ghana because all their profits are declared in tax in So, I told you that one of the, the facts that we find in our analysis is that debt is closely related to capital flight in the sense that some of the debt borrowed by African countries end up in safe havens, in private bank accounts. So, the problem is, I mean, the, 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 the conclusion is that some of the money never benefited African countries. So, that money, that was lent to African countries, ended up in private pockets with the complicity of bankers. <laughs> we call it audits. But the lawyers were very specific. Lawyers have looked at this issue for a long time. They have proposed a very clear definition of what is called audits debt. Debt that is classified as audits is debt that was borrowed without the consent of the people. This is the case for, say, a corrupt regime with no parliamentary representation where the actions of the government are not, uh, there are no checks and balances for the government's actions. That the debt was not, did not benefit the people in the sense that it was not used to finance development projects, health, education, and so on. And the lenders knew about this fact, that money was being squandered, it was not being used for development purposes. Some people may ask me, how can the lender know that the money is being squandered? It is the responsibility as part of normal banking practice for lenders to monitor the use of the loans, especially official development finance institutions. I worked for the African Development Bank. We spent a lot of time monitoring the use of the loans. So if the lender does not do that, if the lender does not do what we call due diligence at the beginning of the process to ensure that there is actually a project to be financed, there are mechanisms to, to, to manage the loans. It is the responsibility of the lender then, if money goes missing. So then let me venture into <coughs> philosophy. What would Plato say about all this? We talked about lending, borrowing, obvious debt, responsibility of the, of, the, of, the, of the government. The money that comes into Africa gets squandered, but African countries still have to pay for it. 
means meaning the people of Africa still have to pay for it. What does it, um, how does it fit with Plato's philosophy about the state, justice, and, um, and the role of, of rulers? With, I submit that uh, Africa's modern state results from failure of the state. A state's responsibility is to represent the interests of the people. The state or the government is the agent of the people who are the principal. So when the state is borrowing and enriching the leaders, it has failed the people. It is a, a, it's a evidence of dysfunctional leadership because leadership is about serving the interests of the people, as you see from uh, Plato's definition of, of leadership. But also, it's a, it's a result of a global a shadow financial system putting profit before the people. And it is a severe form of social injustice, as we as said. Uh, so, but then why do states that fail the people persist for so long? In our book, we document many cases of failed state, I mean, state failure in the, cross, in, in, the, in the context of lending and borrowing. Uh, the case of Mobutu, many people may have heard about the Congo, Zaire, in, in, in the old days, with Mobutu, who was the president of, of that country, ended up being, uh, being wealthier than the, than the country at, at the end of this regime. So how do they stay in power if in fact they're failing the people? Why don't people just vote them out of the office? And how do bad, bad rulers rise up uh, in power and remain in power for, for so long? And why uh, does social injustice prevail? And what can be done in the interest of the people uh, and the global community? Um, according, to, according to Plato, um, a perfect state would encompass the, uh, the following criteria. Wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Which means basically, if you look at good statement, would be wise, courageous, temperate, and would be just. Vis-a-vis -vis the needs of the, of the people. Now, in the Islamic states, there are two concepts two, we, we call principal and agent. Everybody knows what an agent is. Somebody who represents you. So, if you look at the state or the government and the people, the government is representing the people, is acting, should be acting, in the interest of the people. So the people are the principle. So, when we go back to the, uh, to the case of borrowing for development financing, the government, when a government official comes to New York, Paris to borrow for in interest of their of their of the country, they are representing the country. They are the agent. They should borrow only if they know that they are going to finance development programs in the interest of the people. So that's how a good government should be run to represent the interests of the people who are the principal. So what would then let us say would African government be be graded as good states, as good governments, knowing that we have seen that a lot of money that is borrowed by African countries ends up in private pockets. When external borrowing fuels capital flight, it's a sign of failure per Plato the definition of a perfect state because it's not responsible, it's not wise. So who, who should we blame? Should we blame the, the African corrupt uh, leaders? That's easy. We say Africa is corrupt, so therefore they, that's why it is, uh, we see so much capital flight. Or should we blame the bankers who allow that to happen because they lend the money to African countries and they see money coming back in, in suitcases and they do nothing? Okay. Or should we blame the people of Africa who fail to vote their bad leaders out of office? My claim is that the responsibility is shared between bad African government leaders and their bankers and their supporters, uh, foreign supporters in general. Um, I told about 
Mobutu, the president of Zaire, then it's called the, the, the Congo. He was asked once, was challenged by a, by a, by a journalist that people were saying that he's corrupt. So this is what he said in response. He said, you guys told how to, how to be corrupt. You Europeans brought corruption to Africa. It's not our responsibility. It's not our, our, our fault. And it takes two to be corrupt. A corrupter and a, and a, and a, uh, and a corrupted. Um, I'll come back to this. So this is Mobutu. This is for those who have not had not seen it. He says it takes two to be corrupt, the corrupter and the corrupted. He's basically blaming it on the colonizers. And you have seen this, you read this many times. If you read, if you study a student in, in African history, African economic development, there are many people who find it easy to blame all the problems of Africa on the colonial regime. Of course, colonization was bad. But how long are we going to blame on things that happened in the 50s? Countries have had 40, 50 years of independence. I mean, it's time to take responsibility. Um, so, what would, would Plato now propose as African rulers? He would say that rulers of Africa should be the elder, the best of the elders, the best guardians who love their subjects more than uh, most and think that they have a common interest with the people in the welfare of the state. That's his definition of good leader. And he would add that no man would be a ruler unless he were induced by the hope of reward from leadership and of, or the fear of punishment. You'll be punished if you don't rule. In the introduction, you heard that Plato believed that leaders should be philosophers or philosophers should be leaders. So if you are a philosopher, mean a wise person, interested in, interest, uh, in the well-being of the people, and you decide not to run for office, don't go and complain that there is a bad leader. Because you should have run for office and be the leader. Okay? So that's the, the reward you get is you get to serve the people. The punishment of not volunteering to be a leader is that you then suffer from bad relationship of other of other. And his view is that a wise leader would be rewarded for the for serving the people. Um, Odious then is problematic in the, con in the context of Plato's view about <coughs> justice and, and, uh, and interest of the people. Uh, he, he viewed justice as human virtue that makes a person self con uh, consistent and good, but also viewed justice as social consciousness that makes society internally harmonious and good. Now, what you saw as capital flight is in the pockets of the elite, the political elite, and this we're talking about a continent where the large majority don't have access to drinking water, health, education, and so on. What kind of justice is that? I don't think that Plato would be very happy with that uh, statement. So what would, he, would Plato say about external debt? Philosophers, Plato and other, uh, others, believe that if you owe, if you contracted a debt, it's only honest to pay back the loan. But I'm asking now, for all those debts that African countries have, have contracted, some of which ended up in private accounts, should African countries pay all that debt? Would, would better suggest that justice requires countries to pay back any debt they may have contracted? I submit that that would be unjust justice for African countries to pay back debts which did not finance development. The audience had of Not all the debt, audience debt. The just solution for would be for African countries to only pay the debt that financed development. So it is useful, it would be necessary to audit the loans borrowed by African countries and sort out which loans went to be into education, infrastructure and, and, and health. And those laws should be, should be paid back. But the laws that went back into Cayman Islands in private accounts 
those should not be the responsibility of Africa of African people. Um, a just process would then shift the burden of proof on the lender to show where the money went. So if the audit showed that there is missing money, it's the lender to show where the money went, not the African people. So the question to you, question a few, a couple of questions to you. But before I go there, let me go back to to this the, the issue of debt audit. Um, in 2007, I think, uh, the president of Ecuador uh, established a commission to review the loans borrowed by Ecuador, all the loans, and establish the legitimacy of the loans. Of course, when he did that, people were saying, you'll be penalized by the markets, the lenders will no longer lend the money, lend money to you, it's a, it's a suicide for the country. He said, fine. In any case, I'm bleeding because I'm paying more money than I'm receiving. So if they stop lending to me, fine. I stop paying. I come off uh, on the positive side. So he, uh, the commission went on and reviewed the debt owed by, by, uh, by Ecuador. And of course, the, the, the idea was to rename and repudiate odious debts. As a result, Ecuador was able to reduce dramatically the burden of debt because the, the lenders then agreed to negotiate the, 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 repayment loan, the, the loan repayment. And some of the loans, they were able to buy back the loans at uh, about 35, 35 cents per dollar, which means that the, the, the loan was reduced by 60, 65%. So there are precedents in, in, in history where countries have reneged on paying for their debt. Even in the U.S., the U.S. when they uh, when they won the Panama War, they re, they, uh, the, uh, the Cuban War, the U.S. refused to pay to take responsibility for the loans incurred by the, under the Spanish uh, 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 control. When you remember, all of you were here when Saddam Hussein's regime fell, the U.S. challenged the legitimacy of the loans incurred by Saddam Hussein. And because it, they, the U.S. government uh, said that it would be unfair for the Iraqi people to incur the burden of debt, which part of part of which actually financed the weapons that were used to kill them. So that debt was declared also for this. Today, uh, just a few weeks ago, the last month, uh, the Norwegian government has has approved. The parliament has approved a new procedure now that is going to review and audit the debt, uh, the lending, the loans by Norway to developing countries to establish again the legitimacy of, of those loans. And the government is prepared to cancel all the loans that will, 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 are going to be uh, uh, found missing or have not uh, contributed to development in those countries. So we believe that there, is a, there's a, there are precedents that African countries can capitalize on and their supporters to actually challenge the, the odious debts that were incurred um, under dictatorial regimes. Uh, so my question to you is, is capital flight a problem of developing, developing countries only? Why sh should developing countries worry about capital flight or care about capital flight? Why should the ordinary citizen like you be concerned about capital flight and odious debt? Should you or should you not? One of the things you need to know is that, of course, the first people to, to suffer from uh, bad management of external loans, corruption and so on, are the African people who don't have schools, who don't have medicine, who don't have uh, the, basic, the basic needs. But as a global citizen, poverty in Africa, deprivation in Africa also affects you. It's, uh, prosperity in the world benefits everybody. Even a business in the U.S., a U.S. business would want to see a prosperous Africa because that, that means you can invest in Africa. That, is, that expands your market. But also as a U.S. taxpayer, you know that you are the one financing aid to Africa. Would you want to see that aid, that aid is used effectively? that is actually contributing to development financing, rather than being siphoned out by corrupt leaders 
uh, in the form of capital flight. So the ordinary citizen should care about capital flight because it's actually undermining your goal, which is contributing to good to the, to the good of the common uh, people in African countries and developing, developing countries in general. But also, I told you that one of the things that facilitates capital flight is the shadow financial financial system, safe havens, and so on. If when companies, big companies, are able to hide their tax dues in safe habits, that means you have to pay higher taxes. Or, I don't, or also, you get less funding for public schools and public uh, infrastructure and social services in general. So it, it's also a matter that what should interest the ordinary citizen, you and, 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 and anybody else. So, once again, I apologize, I must, I must have um, mutilated the philosophy in my, in my presentation, but I hope I said some of the things that, that are sensible to you, and I, I thank you very much for your, for your, for your attention. Thank you so much. I read Plato when I was a freshman in college, and really what stayed with me and what I remember is how he constantly at, was asking what is right, what is just, and it was great how you wove the economic background into those big questions, and I would say you really do understand Plato very well. We don't have a medal for you, which some of your French fans have suggested uh, you deserve, but we have this um, sort of plaque that's been constructed out of a poster. Uh, uh, announcing your lecture. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you again. For your so that concludes the formal proceedings. I know that some of you have to leave for events and that uh, you want to get well seated for the presidential debate. Uh, but those who wish to stay, I invite to come up to the front and to uh, feel free to come up to the speaker and ask questions. Money can uh, borrowed money can be siphoned out as capital flight. Does it make a difference whether it is from uh, Chinese government or private banks or development banks? It does matter because typically public institutions tend to have more rigid, transparent rules, like the World Bank, African Development Bank. They have procedures. They have a board that oversees all, all the all the loans procedures. We don't know what procedures goes into private banks when they are issuing loans to, to, to government. Government official shows up in the morning, meets the whatever the loan officer, and they check the sign. There is much less due process as due diligence that goes into to, to these kinds of, of, uh, of loans. But also different bilateral lenders have different ways of doing things. Uh, say the US, China, France may do things differently. They have been, I'm sure you have heard about uh, concerns about, say, China not paying attention to institutional issues like democracy, human rights, and so on. 
and that's a major concern, especially for countries that really don't have uh, checks and balances to to protect the, the people. In that case, the lending would actually be strengthening the dictatorship itself. Yes. Um, still on the systematic audit, you talk about um, canceling a lot of the debt that cannot be traced, um, but wouldn't that instead um, keep the government um, continues the cycle of um, stealing money because if the debts are canceled, then um, they have less to worry about, and then they can borrow sure. more money. Uh, and the people, and the people. So when you say canceling the debt, is how exactly is it helping the African people? Because you know, at the end of the time, the government. I'm also from an African country. I'm from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. The government and the public don't work together. Mm -hmm. So anything between the government and outside government is between them too, and the public tend to not be included. So how? Excellent question. Next time I'll call you when I go to present this, you we'll talk about exactly that. The question is, if the audit establishes that a particular loan was squandered, is the solution of cancelling the loan really efficient? Because it basically exonerates the government officials who stole the money. And it's worse. I'll give you an example. There was, uh, when I was presenting the book in Sweden, one of the uh, participants who is from an NGO who, who are working on issues of debt relief and uh, body estates and, and all that, complained about the situation where the government of Sweden had lent money to a country in Africa back in the 70s uh, to the tune of 60 million of their currency. Uh, last year, no, it was 2010, there was uh, an audit and, uh, no, no, not an audit, the government, the current government of the Congo negotiated debt relief with the government of Sweden. So one of the, of the of these loans is the one that had led, that had led to this government in the 1970s. So it was written off by the government. But the loan had been financed by the Exim Bank uh, import Ex export bank of Sweden. That's, it, that's how it normally many times works. You have a government providing the resources, but the resources are actually managed by a private bank, which generates a profit. And this time, since they are re writing off the loan, so the, co the, the country is not going to pay back the loan again. But the government has to pay to set the, the, the private bank so that it can write it off of their books. Now the question is, how much do they actually give to the, the, the commercial bank? It's today. Then it was 60 million. In that particular case, the bank received 1.2 billion out of 60 million because of interest, the private interest and so on. Which means that the bank gets to keep, I mean, it make, makes a lot of profit, 14% in, in, in interest. The, the double geopathy is that the government then counts that debt write-off as new aid to that country. So the, country, the people of that country get nothing. The corrupt leaders who stole the money go, go uh, hands free. And the bank makes a, makes a killing. So it's a very unjust process. But at least you can say because the people are not going to pay the loan anymore. But it's still not justice because those who stole the money keep the money. The bank, which may have colluded with the, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the corrupt leaders, get to get the profit. And the country is penalized by it because it's not going to get more aid from, from the donor bank. So at least but, but the, the process of debt audit would at least sh put, show light, shed light on which loans have been benefiting the country and which, which loans have not been benefiting the countries. But, the next step is to actually attribute responsibility to who stole the money, who invested the money, and those persons should be prosecuted and the money repatriated to the, to the, to the, to the country. So there is a process that started in, 19, in 2007. It's called the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative by the World Bank in the UN. And the idea is to help countries track down the stolen money so that they can repatriate it. 
not much has been ha has happened so far. On uh, there has been a, a small amount of Apache's money in Nigeria that has been uh, repatriated in, to Nigeria, but that's a small amount uh, based on uh, compared to the amount of capital fund that has been in Nigeria. So debt audit can help attribute responsibility to who was managing that project. Therefore, it's responsible for for capital fund, and then money should be repatriated. Yes, uh, that's a very important question. Beyond uh, debt management, there are other, I mean, the, uh, capital flight is not just financed by stolen money from borrowing, borrowed money. It's financed through, uh, um, I, I told you, missing oil exports. In, in, when we do our numbers, we find that mineral rich and oil rich countries actually come on the top in terms of huge amount of capital flight. Nigeria, Angola, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon. Uh, Sudan, because of the big volumes of exports of oil, it's easy to manipulate the invoices and big chunks of money end up in private money. Which means that, in addition to also to, to, to improving and more, having more transparent lending and borrowing processes, you need also more transparency in the management of natural resources. Both on the government side, but also on the multinational corporation side, because Many of those things happen because of complicity between the government officials and the, and the, and the, and the private companies, which are willing to, to, to get to sign fake invoices. They, ex they import for 100 million, they give invoices of, of, of 80 million, which is submitted to the, to, the, to, the, to the central bank. So you have responsibility on, on both ends, which, which, which needs to be addressed also in terms of transparency. How heavily do you think issues such as the regime tied to the political climate would matter and who has the most um, capital flight? It matters a lot, 120%. So I was talking about, for example, how money disappears from uh, resource, natural resource exports. And I said that when you look at the top countries with the highest amount of capital flight, it's mineral resources, rich countries, uh, the DRC, and oil resource, resource rich countries, Angola, and so on. But if you look at countries like Botswana, which has a huge amount of land, it has very little capital. Governance, transparency, much of that. So, and, and there is no way you can go around governance to, to, to promote development. People have argued that you don't need democracy, you don't need governance, you can have high growth even under dictatorship. But my question is, how long will this last? We only need the end of the, the, the dictatorship for it to collapse. And we have seen many cases where individuals who were enlightened in the beginning were able to actually generate good positive outcomes. But as they stay in power for so long, around them you have a corrosive environment that, that, that's built of brain seeking corruption and so on that really, really undermine whatever good, good outcomes you have. So corruption plays a big role. Yes. Since there is a disparity between the people's interests and between the interests of the people in power, mm -hmm. couldn't we then treat this as a political problem and help the people? You know how we give a bunch of aid money to help them with mm -hmm. other things? Why don't we use some of that to help the people with resources, whatever they need to help them overthrow their regimes and help them to, over time, establish democracies? Very good point, because I, there is, it's a political problem in the sense that it's lack of accountability of the leadership. So if you're going to, to think of solutions to, issue, to the problem of capital flight, you have to think about institutions. What kind of institutional environment would help, would allow the people to have control or to hold governments accountable to the people so that they can have there is transparency in the management of, of resources? So the, the, the point you make, which is how can donors or as we call them, partners of Africa, help resolve the issue of, of, uh, of capital flight through, uh, sorry, let me tell you The solution is to 
not condition aid to institutional reforms, but use aid to assist countries to build institutions. Because many times this is an area that donors don't want to go into because it's, it's, a, it's a little uh, uncharted waters. When you, when you actually venture into institutional reforms, you may make some people uncomfortable, the ruling government, the ruling leaders. But that's the cost. That's, that's the way to go. Because many times we have seen where donors shy away from influencing institutional reforms because they want to remain friends with, uh, with the leaders in power, because maybe the, power, the leaders in power are helping them uh, with other strategic interests. I talked about the issue of Mobutu. Mobutu was left in power and even sustained in power because he was an anti-communist uh, ally. So whatever he did, people turned a blind eye. But you know what happens at the end? You basically are destroying the country. The, the country. So I think the donor community have, has to come to closure about institutional reform. And my sense is that with aid, they have a lot of leverage to influence institutional reform. Yeah. Um, staying on the topic of aid, um, you were talking about the relationship between what's governance and like August sub-Saharan governance and the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's also like it's also a known fact that a lot of the aid is to keep um, African countries dependent on Western countries. Mm -hmm. And so in a way it's not really helpful to most African countries, all the aids they get. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you heard about you I'm pretty sure you know about Gaddafi's like proposal about the gold diner diner. Mm -hmm. And um, as an economist, do you think if it was actually followed through, most African countries would be better off that signed into it? Or, you know, how, because obviously it was looked down upon by the West because that would lose a lot of interest abroad. But if African countries would have actually followed through, would it have benefited them and would their economy be better off? Today? Yeah, Qaddafi had lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but that one and, but that one and like, uh, because it was very famous, it, it was very popular. A lot of people were rooting for it. The, the question is, is aid helping Africa or not? Okay. If you look at, there are many cases in Africa, there are many instances in Africa where aid has been wasted because it was on bad projects or even was disappeared in the, in the pockets of people. In that case, the country didn't get much out of it. But there are also the majority of cases where you can actually see visible impact of aid. You, I, I told you I was in, in Tunisia for the last three years. Tunisia has first class infrastructure in terms of roads, electricity, and so on. And the bulk of it is financed by World Bank, IDB, loans. So you do see visible impact of aid when it is well managed. So the issue is management of aid. It's not aid by itself, because people get lost with the philosophy of aid, aid, uh, you have heard about Dambisa Moyo who says aid is bad for Africa. So I don't believe it. Anything that's badly managed is bad. <laughs> Even private sector can be, can be bad if it's badly managed. So the issue is how do you get it to be well managed to finance projects which are identifiable well crafted and well balanced. It means many times there is an issue of capacity, but at least the, the biggest problem is transparency. Because many, as you say, the relationship between donors and governments is almost a privileged relationship. Most people, most government leaders, if you ask them that, if you told them that they should disclose the amount of aid they get, the condition that they would say, no, 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 this is government business. What do you mean government business? Government is there to serve the people. Because the people eventually are the ones who are going to pay for these, for these loans. So more transparency would help, more participation of the people in terms of deciding which projects are going to be, to be implemented, monitoring of the, of the, of the, of the dimension of, 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 of the project would help get more benefits out of, out of aid. So my position is just the opposite, that African countries actually would need more aid in volume, but better aid better managed aid, but also more aid targeted to very specific areas like infrastructure, education, and, and health.
wonder if we should take uh, one more question and then wrap up. Then we'll go listen to the debate. <laughs> yes. How aware, are, how aware would the average app citizen be of this? How would what? How aware is the average African citizen of what is happening? Uh, unfortunately, not much. <laughs> not enough. Uh, but uh, we're hoping that, um, as I see, when we started working on this topic, at least me, 1996-7, uh, people didn't know much about capital flight and so on. But these days, I think, first of all, with the democratic awakening in the, in the countries, in, uh, improvement in the media, there's more private uh, free press, especially in some countries, South Africa, Kenya, and so on. We think that this issue is going to be more visible and more, uh, more people will be aware of it. Um, uh, in February, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, that's based in Addis Ababa, established a high-level panel uh, to monitor, to basically debate the issue of the financial flows and propose strategies to, to combat it. It's headed by the former president of, uh, of uh, South Africa, Tabon Beki. I'm a member of the technical committee of, of the panel. This is already a big achievement that a Pan-African institution is actually put this on their agenda. On the, and it's going to be debated on all the, the uh, ministerial conferences and meetings of, of the president. In Brazil next month, there's a uh, international uh, conference on corruption. There will be a session on, on the list of financial flows of, from Africa, and Becky will be speaking at, at that conference. This is unique. Fifteen years ago, you wouldn't talk about a couple of flights from Africa. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good students, good questions. Yes, excellent questions. And if you want to talk more about it, send me emails, questions, <coughs> and wish. And enjoy the debate.